Initiation by Elizabeth H. Chapter 38 As a Priestess The priestesses in the temple have different tasks, corresponding to their different abilities. Some teach the temple dancers. Some help the restless souls of departed dead who wander about aimlessly in the earth's atmosphere. In holy sleep, the priestesses help them on their path towards further spiritual development. Without help, they would stagnate for hundreds, perhaps even thousands of years, because without organs of sense, they have no opportunity to gather experience or to contact other beings. They are introverted and they find no path on which to progress. The priestesses seek out these restless souls, penetrate their beings with the power of love, and, thanks to their inner identity, they irradiate their consciousness with ideas that help them find a solution and a way out of their condition. These priestesses, thus, perform a twofold duty. They help wandering souls forward and simultaneously purify the Earth's atmosphere. There are priestesses who work towards developing healthier, more beautiful and more spiritual young people through initiating them in the mysteries of physical love. They teach young men to transmute their physical urge through the power of the spirit and to aim for a higher spiritual union, a sacrament. They also teach young men who are on the point of marrying about this sacred power so that they can transmit this energy to their wives after marriage and thus beget noble children. Lastly, certain priestesses perform the same tasks as the priests. They teach groups of neophytes, they give instructions for exercises and concentration, and they receive people who need advice regarding special problems. As soon as these priestesses reach an advanced degree of priesthood, they are permitted to use the staff of life in healing the sick. In this way, a priestess can become a high priestess. I have been assigned to this group. I am truly delighted with my task. It's nothing less than wonderful to observe the minds and souls of my pupils as they develop step by step and manifest more and more of divinity. For me, it's like watching a bit of opaque material gradually become transparent, allowing the divine creative principle to shine through. Every day I experience this with my dear neophytes. I also enjoy taking care of people who come to the temple seeking advice in affairs of the spirit or matters of the body. I receive them in my little cell, the same one Ima assigned to me when I first came to the temple. At such times, people show me their other face, other in quotes, the face that nobody else sees, a face they do not often know themselves. I see this inner face in every creature, and it's instructive to hear about all the different events and experiences that have shaped this inner continence in accordance with the law of action and reaction. Oh, if only everybody could see their own and other people's inner continences. They would never hate each other, and they would never be afraid of each other. There are no bad people. They often harm each other, doing evil things, even cruel things, to others because they believe others are going to do evil to them, and they try to defend themselves in advance out of pure fear. In this way, they give others a real reason to believe that they're acting with bad intentions. But if one could only convince both parties to such evil actions that neither is acting malevolently and that both are merely afraid of each other, they would both breathe a sigh of relief and shake hands. People are ignorant and blind. They don't see each other. And this is the reason for all the animity and the hostility on earth. There's nothing more beautiful than being able to open blind eyes and watch the brilliant look of understanding and knowledge begin to shine. In addition to this work, I'm permitted 
to be present when Tehotek or his dep deputy uses the staff of life to heal the sick. In the early morning, they arrive coming by themselves or with the aid of friends or relatives who bring them to the temple. Tehotek then conducts new vital force into their sick bodies. I often watch how the staff of life completely heals broken bones or horrible wounds in just a few moments' time, leaving behind only a thick spot in the bone or a tiny scar to show where the wound or the break was. Just as two pieces of metal can be welded together into one piece through heat, broken bones are mended by the staff of life and deep wounds and muscles, ligaments, blood vessels, nerves, and skin grow together again. With equal speed, this staff of life can heal the most serious inflammations of the lungs, kidneys, and other organs. Great indeed is the mercy and the grace of God for the gift he has made to mankind of this means for the recovery of health. Beside my work in the temple, I continue to fulfill the duties of the wife of the Pharaoh. Just as I used to do in the past, I sit beside my father at festive receptions and other public events. At such times, I have plenty of opportunity to observe people of the court and all the others who attend these high feasts. Sometimes we receive messengers and emissaries from strange countries. They are quite different from these sons of men among us. The color of their skin, their physical stature, and the shape of their heads are all different, and they radiate different force, forces. They sometimes bring us wonderful things as gifts, things that are quite unknown in our country, animals I've never seen before, precious gems, cloth, beautiful painted pottery. Father has arranged for artists to come from some of these far countries to teach our young people of the temple. On the other hand, some of our artists and wise men have traveled far abroad to teach our arts and sciences. Father has told me that we will someday visit these great countries. Ever since my initiation, I have also been permitted to go for chariot rides alone with the lions. Through my initiation, I received the ability to guide my willpower into the nervous centers of other living creatures, thus bringing them completely under my control. I now control my own body, the activated nerve centers, which are still latent and undeveloped in the sons of men, and I can send out penetrating radiations of willpower that other such living creatures are turned into unconscious tools of my will. I never forget, however, that God's highest gift to man is the right of self-determination, and I know this right must never be infringed. That would be black magic. That's why I never use my willpower against a person. Often enough, it would be so easy to help a person solve a difficult problem if I were merely to fill him with my will. But this would mean that I would be taking on the responsibility myself, and the solution of the problem would be mine, not his. In this way, I would be robbing him of an opportunity to pass a test. Every person must solve his own problems, for only in this way can we gather experience, develop willpower, and widen the horizon of consciousness. Animals are directly subject to natural forces. They automatically and instinctively carry out the will of nature and possess no self-determination. So I can completely subject my lions to my will. It's wonderful how these magnificent animals immediately carry out my thoughts. They react to the slightest impulse of my will. And I often have the feeling that they belong just as much to myself as my hands and feet do, the same divine self is the life of every living creature and the love animals feel is nothing but the unconscious striving to achieve the unity of the self on the lowest physical plane of consciousness. 
A child going through the phase of awakening consciousness also tries involuntarily to achieve the same unity and identity by putting into its mouth everything it can get its little hands on. Animals have that same instinct. The unity and the love between me and my lions is so great that they like to take my hand or even my head between their jaws as if they were going to eat me. Naturally, they don't bite me, and their play is not to be taken lightly. I can understand that when they eat a gazelle, for example, they are only following out their instinctive striving for unity. The instinct for self-preservation has the same source as the instinct for the preservation of the species, striving for the divine state of unity. That's why the manifestations of both instincts are so close together and often overlap. Nature exploits this primordial tendency towards unity in order to create progeny through the instinct for procreation and propagation of the species and in order to preserve the body through the satisfaction of hunger. This is the reason why meat, meat lions get. Now, this is the reason why the meat lions get from their keepers never tastes as good as the flesh they tear from the body of a fresh-killed prey. For in this latter act, they are unconsciously experiencing a form of union with the living, with life itself. With dead flesh, they can satisfy only their hunger, but not their subconscious striving towards union. I get a great deal of pleasure out of spending my time with my lions. It's thrilling to observe how these majestic animals manifest all the characteristics of the divine Ra, the sun, transformed to the animal level. Little Bogart, too, shares my pleasure in the lions, just as he is in harmony with me in everything I do or say. How well I remember the endless patience my father exhibited when he taught me how to stand up in a chariot speeding over uneven ground. It's my turn now to teach that same technique to Bogar. He's very skillful, instinctively making the right movements, and after a short time, he's able to accompany me even on long rides. During quieter periods, Father and I withdraw to our little holiday house on the seashore. Bogar comes with us, and the three of us enjoy the pleasures of the sun and sand and water. Father, too, likes to spend time with the little boy, and we find it thrilling to watch his pure soul develop like a magnificent flower. Once, after watching Bogar for quite a while, Father calls and asks him to come over close, and as soon as Bogar is near enough for quiet conversation, Father asks him, Well, Bogar, would you like to work with me? Bogar prostrates himself before Father, and with his hands together as a sign of profoundest respect, he replies, Master, I'll devote my whole life to the task you give me in order to be worthy of it. Father pats the boy's head. Stand up, Bogar, he says. You will work with us in the great task of redeeming the earth. Just do what your teachers in the temple tell you, and one day you will be a co-worker with us. Stand up. You don't need to throw yourself on the ground before me. Bogar can't contain his joy. He jumps around like a little monkey. Then he tries to be dignified like a grown-up, worthy of father's confidence. Finally, he runs down to the seashore to look for mussels. When I'm alone with father, I ask him, Father, now that I've been initiated, when I raise myself above the level of time, I can look into the past and the future, the same as you, but I still can't recognize anything in my own future. Why is that? The only importance I attach to the future is the development it will bring me in my progress up to the last highest divine degree, but please explain to me why I, can't, why I can see everybody else's future but my own. I can only see mist before my eyes when I turn my consciousness towards my own future. Father looks at me and smiles and waits. 
I smile back and answer him in thought. We understand each other. His look tells me, what are you asking for? If you don't see your future, it simply means that's the way it's meant to be so you can fulfill your task properly. Don't bother about it, but do everything to attain by your own efforts the highest degree you reached with Tohotek's help during your initiation. When our tasks call us back to the city, the days go by as in the past, and I spend some time in the temple and some in the palace. I love my work. It satisfies me completely. Nevertheless, all day long, I go about with a joyful anticipation of being able to withdraw into myself, into God, when my day's duties are over. Every time I turn inward with a determination to reach the highest degree by my own efforts, and I actually do come nearer and nearer to perfect fulfillment, every, yet every time I return to my personal consciousness, I get up disappointed. Once again I realize I have failed to achieve the last and the highest reality which I experienced in my initiation and which burns in my memory like an unquenchable flame. My only consolation in such moments is that of looking forward to participating in the Vesper prayers and meditations with Tehotep. Tehotep, his deputy, the priests, the priestesses, initiates all meet in the temple at sunset. We sit in a circle, and Tehotep and his deputy sitting diametrically opposite each other, and thus forming two poles. All the rest of us form two semicircles on either side. It takes us a while to free our spiritual body from impurities which have unavoidably absorbed during during our contacts with the sons of men. Then Tehotep extends his blessed hands to his neighbors on either side. All the rest of us join hands to this, forming a circuit through which Tehotep and his deputy conduct a current of highest, supreme, divine degree in our bodies. This helps us experience the supreme state of divine unity. In this way, our nerves develop resistance much faster than they would if we were dependent only on our own energies. These moments of bliss experienced daily through our evening prayers give meaning and contact to our whole life. Oh God, give me the strength to reach you with my consciousness by my own efforts. <laughs>